Hello learners. Today we are going to study the poem by John Donne, a 17th century poet. John Donne, who was born in 1573, belonged to a Roman Catholic family. At that time, Queen Elizabeth I was ruling England, and her government often punished and harassed Catholics. John Donne, though he was very brilliant and was educated at Oxford and Cambridge, however, could not earn his graduate degree because there was a law that banned Catholics from graduating. As a young man, John Donne traveled across Europe between 1596 and 1597. After taking part in several military expeditions, John Donne became secretary to Sir Thomas Egerton, a prominent member of the royal court, and he fell in love with Sir Thomas Egerton's niece, Anne Moore, and soon married her in secret. When Moore's father found out, he used his influence to briefly imprison John Donne and two of his friends. You know, therefore, there is the statement that John Donne met Anne Donne and were undone. After Donne's release from prison, he reunited with his bride and settled on a land owned by Moore's cousin in Surrey. Initially, the couple struggled financially until 1609, when Dunn's father-in-law reconciled and gave John Dunn his wife's dowry. With the growth of Dunn's family, he was prompted to seek favours from the king. In 1610 and 1611, he wrote two anti-Catholic polemics. King James then was pleased with John Dunn's work and in 1621, the king appointed Dunn to be the dean of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Here, he often preached to the citizens of London from an outdoor pulpit. And sometimes the king also attended John Dunn's preaching. Before we go into the poem in detail, the poem titled The Good Morrow, let us know a few characteristics of the 17th century England, the metaphysical school of poetry and John Donne's works. The early 17th century and especially the period of English Revolution between 1640 and 1660 was a time of intense unrest in all areas of life. And we find this represented in religion, science, politics, domestic relations and culture. This period of intense activity is also reflected in the literature of this era. And the literature of this era registers a heightened focus on and analysis of the self and the personal life. Now this was also a time when many geographical explorations were being undertaken across the world. And as a result, new countries were being discovered. And we find a considerable influence of these phenomenal changes that are reflected in the literature of the period. The term metaphysical poets is coined by the poet and critic Dr. Samuel Johnson. And he used this term to describe a group of British poets of the 17th century. Now, the metaphysical poets and their work was characterized by the inventive use of conceits and by the speculation about topics such as love or religion. Some of the poets who belong to this metaphysical school of poetry are John Donne, George Herbert, Henry Vaughan, Edward Herbert, Thomas Carew, Andrew Marvel, Richard Lovelace, Sir John Suckling and a few others. Now what are the characteristic features of the school of poetry? Metaphysical poets are known for what is often called as metaphysical wit and conceit. The hallmark of their poetry is a metaphysical conceit that is a figure of speech that employs unusual and paradoxical images. And these poets rely on intellectual wit 
they represent and use learned imagery and they use subtle argument in their poetry. Although these techniques are not new, but these poets are known for an innovative approach and that makes their poetry a new kind of poetry and therefore they are called as metaphysical school of poets. Now what do we understand by the term metaphysics? Meta means above, physics means physical that is above the physical realm. In other words, it means that their poetry affects our intellectual level. Why? Because it is characterized by startling comparisons or contrasts of a metaphysical quality. For example, in a poem titled A Valediction Forbidding Morning, John Dunn compares the love he shares with his wife to a compass. John Dunn argues in the poem that he and his wife will remain joined together in spirit even though they move apart from each other physically. Sometimes metaphysical poetry is marked by mockery of sentimental romantic poetry or sometimes you find a gross exaggeration which is called as hyperbole and sometimes they also present their things or their reasonings in a very logical argumentative manner. Because the metaphysical poets were men of learning and to show their learning was their whole endeavor, unluckily they instead of trying to use rhyme they wrote only verses and very often such verses they stand the trial of the finger better than of the ear that means it doesn't sound like poetry to us. The poetry is characterized by highly intellectualized poetry and marked by bold and ingenious conceits, incongruous imagery, complexity and subtlety of thought, frequent use of paradox and often there is a deliberate harshness or a rigidity of expression. Metaphysical poets use startling juxtapositions in their poetry in order to create a greater significance in their arguments and intended meanings throughout the poem. And John Dunn is said to be the unsurpassed metaphysical poet. John Dunn's greatness and his poetry is noted because of its ingenious fusion of wit and seriousness. And his poetry represents a shift from classical models toward a more personal style. Dunn's poetry is also very unique since his poems are on a wide range of secular and religious subjects. He wrote cynical verse about inconstancy. For example, in a poem, go and catch a falling star and I can love both fair and brown. He wrote poems which talk about true love such as the current poem, The Good Morrow and another poem, the Sweetest Love, I Do Not Go. Neoplatonic lyrics on the mystical union of lovers, soul and bodies is found in poems such as Air and Angels and The Ecstasy and also in some of the satires. Dunn is also known for his holy sonnets and they are called as hymns. And these sonnets depict his own spiritual struggles. Holy sonnets such as Hymn to God the Father or Batter My Heart, Three Percent God. Another hymn called I'm a Little World Made Cunningly. Some of these poems he begs God to purge him of sin. John Dunn is also known for his excellent sermons and prose. At the beginning of the poem, the poet wonders how the couple before their marriage used to spend their lives, that is before they met each other. Now after they are married with his beloved in arms, the poet realizes that their lives before meeting each other 
were very very empty he considers that phase of their lives in which they didn't meet each other to be as meaningless as the one spent in slumber by seven sleepers of Ephesus in the den. These seven sleepers of Ephesus, they were trying to escape the wrath of the tyrant Emperor Decius. So he thinks that being without his beloved before meeting her, those years were as insignificant as those years which the seven sleepers had spent sleeping. It means that simply those years bear absolutely no importance in his life anymore. Now, what is this reference to the seven sleepers? According to the story, during the persecution of Christians in 250 century, under the Roman emperor called Decius, seven Christian soldiers concealed themselves near the native city of Ephesus in a cave. They were trying to escape punishment for their Christian faith and they hid themselves in this cave. The entry of the cave was later sealed. There, because they protected themselves from being forced to worship pagan idols and the entry was sealed, they fell into a miraculous sleep for seven years. But during the reign of Eastern Roman Emperor Theodosius II, the cave was reopened and the sleepers awoke. Now to come back to the poem, the poet feels that the days when he was yet to discover true love were like those years of emptiness. And now he makes up for those empty years by indulging in other pleasures of life. But now after meeting his beloved, he understood meaning of love. So, he considers those earlier pleasures, those simple pleasures which he took delight in before meeting his beloved, those pleasures were very artificial and childish and also silly. Now, it seems to the poet that it was like those times when a child is weaned from a mother's feeding. During those days, he considers and compares himself to a child who was being weaned on these materialistic pleasures of the world because true love was absent from his life. He compares and he imagines that true love is like mother's milk to the child. The poet thinks that during those days, all objects of beauty that he came across were nothing but his beloved's reflection. To the poet, his beloved is like a beautiful dream which has turned into reality. In the second stanza of the poem, the poet sheds light upon the bliss which envelops the lovers. He says that their souls rise in the light of the new morning of love in their lives. Their hearts are devoid of any kind of fear of commitment, misunderstanding or losing the one they love. It means that their presence in each other's life means so much to them that nothing really catches their attention anymore. So he urges his beloved that they should not worry about any discoveries of new lands, the geographical explorations and which seem the new countries seem to be added to the geographical maps of the world because their world is their own world of mutual love. So he says, let's see discovers to new worlds, let maps to others, Worlds on worlds have shown. Let us possess our world. Each hath one and is one. Dunn suggests to his beloved that they should turn their tiny room in which they make love as their only world. He says that he does not care about how much the sea discoverers expand the boundaries of the world with their discoveries. It implies that the maritime discoveries 
and the new inclusions to the map of the world itself mean nothing to the poet because his world comprises only of his beloved and his self. Their respective individual worlds have now been fused into one world. This drawing of an intellectual parallel from astronomy and geography strengthens the metaphysics of the poem. The poet further talks about the unique beauty of the love which he and his beloved share. John Donne says that sometimes he and his beloved stared into each other's eyes so longingly that they can see their faces in each other's eyes. This reflection of faces in the eyes reveals the true hearts of the lovers. Their hearts are true and spotless in love. This means that their love for each other enables them to get rid of all their bad traits and the harsh feelings that they might have towards the world. Their true love for each other helps them to become better person. In the poet's words, he says, Where can we find two better hemispheres? Without sharp north, without declining west, whatever dies was not mixed equally. The poet feels that unlike the world which is divided into two hemispheres, their world of love knows no boundaries. It does not have a sharp, cold northern hemisphere. You know how cold it is in the winter season in North America, where temperature drops down to minus 30s too. So he says there is no sharp, cold northern hemisphere in their love or in their world of love. And he also says that their world does not have a western hemisphere which has to bid farewell to the sun. So it means that there is sunlight, there is brightness, there is joy and there is forever light and love in their lives, in their world. By drawing to th this reference to the geography again, the poet tries to give us an insight into the unparalleled bliss of their world of love, where it is always warm and sunny. The chill north of the polar region and the declining west of sunset are an evocation of winter and nightfall. You know, winter and nightfall in literature are often symbolic of human mortality, where everything eventually dies down. Hastily, the poet negates the possibility of death. So it appears that the poet has stumbled on to a topic that is too frightening for him to deal with. The topic of the mutability of human life and love. It is transient, both life and love. And so he concludes the poem in a verbal game. He refers to the scientific ideas held by the ancient Greeks, where they used chemistry and science like alchemy and alloy. He believes that their love, which is pure and unalloyed, remains perfect and therefore it cannot change. Because it cannot change, it is everlasting. Since their love is everlasting, it is pure, so it will also not die. Death for done was the ultimate threat to personal identity. We find him inventing similar verbal strategies in other poems also because he wants to challenge the power of death. Some of the themes that you find commonly in Dunn's poetry, the foremost is lovers as microcosms. In Dunn's secular poetry, we often find the theme of Neoplatonic love, where lovers are a world unto themselves. During the Renaissance period, many people believed that the microcosmic human body mirrored the macrocosmic physical world. According to this belief, 
the intellect governs the body much like a king or a queen governs the land. Dunn incorporates the Renaissance notion of the human body as a microcosm into his love poetry. Many of Dunn's poems, most notably poems such as The Sun Rising, The Good Morrow, A Valediction Forbidding Morning, envision a lover or pair of lovers as being entire worlds unto themselves. But rather than use the analogy to imply that the whole world can be compressed into a small space, Dunn uses this idea and notion to show how lovers become so enraptured with each other that they believe they are the only beings in existence. It simply means that the lovers are engrossed so deeply in their love for each other that nothing else really matters. The Neoplatonic conception of love is another theme. The Neoplatonics think that physical love and religious love are two manifestations of the same impulse. In the symposium written by Plato in the 3rd and the 4th century BC, Plato describes physical love as the lowest rung of a ladder. It is the last thing. According to the platonic formulation or his theory, we are attracted first to a single beautiful person, then to beautiful people in general, then comes attraction to beautiful minds, then to beautiful ideas and ultimately we get attracted to beauty itself the highest rung of the ladder. Centuries later, Christian Neoplatonists adapted this idea so that the progression of love culminates in a love of God or culminates in spiritual beauty. Dunn also draws on this Neoplatonic idea of love, especially in his religious poetry which idealizes the Christian love for God. However, the Neoplatonic conception of love appears a little different and a little twisted in Dunn's love poetry. Because in many of his love poems, Dunn asserts the superiority of the speaker's love. He says that this, their love to each other is much more superior than the quotidian, ordinary love by presenting the speaker's love as a manifestation of purer and neoplatonic feeling. In this poem also, we find the poet affirming that their love for each other is pure and unselfish like God's love for humanity. Now, what are some of the motives and symbols that we come across in Dunn's poetry. Dunn's fascination with spheres and this fascination rests partly on the perfection of these shapes and partly on the near infinite associations that one can draw from these spheres. Like other metaphysical poets, Dunn also uses conceits to extend analogies and to make thematic connections between otherwise dissimilar objects. For instance, in The Good Morrow, the speaker, through brilliant metaphorical leaps, he uses the motive of spheres to move from a description of the world to a description of the globes, to a description of his beloved's eyes and then to a description of their perfect love. Rather than simply praise his beloved, the speaker compares her to a faultless shape, the sphere, which contains neither corners nor edges. The comparison to a sphere also emphasizes the way in which his beloved's face has become the world, as far as the speaker is concerned. In a valediction of weeping, the speaker uses a spherical shape of tears to draw out associations with pregnancy, globes, the world and the moon. 
as the speaker cries in this poem valediction each tear contains a miniature reflection of the beloved yet another instance in which the sphere demonstrates the idealized personality and physicality of the person that is being addressed by the persona of the poem another motif is the motif of discovery and conquest particularly in john dunn's love poetry voyages of discovery and conquest illustrate the mystery and magnificence of the speaker's love affairs european explorers began arriving in the americas in the 15th century and when they were returning to england and their continent they were returning with previously unimagined treasures and stories they had so many stories to tell by john dunn's lifetime colonies had been already established in north america and south america and the riches that flowed back to england from these colonies it had a dramatic transformation on the english society that is the society in england in the good morrow and the sun rising the speaker expresses indifference towards all these recent voyages of discovery and conquest and so he tells in good morrow that they would prefer to seek adventure in their own beds with their beloveds rather than be concerned with the new voyages and the discovery of new lands this comparison demonstrates the way in which the beloved's body and personality becomes or proves endlessly fascinating to a person in love to conclude the poem we can say that if the word metaphysical is applied to john dun at all it should be because his imagery derives from a pattern of metaphysics or a unified picture of the universe under god in this case image of the compasses is not a truly metaphysical conceit since it has no transcendent or spiritual dimension it might be argued that dun's truly metaphysical vision is to be found in his forceful affirmations of essential permanence as seen in the good morrow when he says that their love is too pure to be destroyed you know john dun is constantly in search of something an unchanging something that has the power to resist all the powers of destructive nothing the theme of love in dun's poetry is developed around two different strands these include the sexual or covetous nature and the spiritual and the holy nature some of his poems are a celebration of love and they seem to offer us an understanding of love which is not available elsewhere his love poetry reaches back into sensations and metaphors which have been common among all lovers of all ages but through his poetry john dun awakens in us a clarity and freshness of vision that is otherwise blurred in other words we can say that a known and a familiar experience becomes translucent and it illumines our inner flame of experience and so we can say that just like we find in shakespeare's poetry john dun's poetry also comes alive to us in a new and dramatic way i hope you really enjoyed being with us for this poem the good morrow see you in the next session thank you